folks, to this evening's special session of Beers and Bites with our brewery masters, Daryl Richardson and Philip Deems. This evening's show brought to you by co-host Chris Jordan of Fluency Security and Jeremy Murdishaw of Fortify 24 by 7. With that, uh, before we even get into the brewmasters here, let's go ahead and start with Chris. What beer did you bring tonight? Oh, I, I brought an old leaf, but a favorite. I brought a uh, two silo mosaic goat. And then I'm, I'm, I'm working up, getting ready for my summer brews. I got a raspberry sour by uh, Mickey Jewel. Uh, that's a Buffalo uh, one. So I've not really done many New York beers. So this is going to be a new one for me. All right, Jeremy, what did you bring tonight? First of all, before I get into the beer, I want to give a shout out to an organization called. Uh, and then I lost my train of thought. Sorry. Earn your booze. <laughs> they make a series of motivational shirts for uh, weightlifters or wannabe weightlifters, right? IPA, so if you want your beer, it, nice. you got to earn it, right? So I love that shirt, dude. That's to perfect. that end, uh, and by the way, they're a veteran-owned business, so support your uh, support the vets. Uh, buy 100%. shirts. They got all kinds of apparel. So uh, today we've got the uh, Stone Neverending Haze. Nice. That's uh, good Stone one. Brewery, one of my favorites here in California. Stone's um, one of the originals, man. One of the originals. Oh, yeah. And then we got the, uh, sticking with the Stone theme, uh, we got the Fear the Movie Lions, oh, which is another a fantastic beer of theirs. So, <laughs> cheers. That's you have a, a stellar right. palate. Stellar palate. So, uh, with that, I'll go ahead and show mine because I know that the brewmasters here have probably got more than one that they're going to show off. So, uh, <laughs> I understand that I'm. I have a Cigar City beer tonight, uh, an Indian Pale L. But uh, as I also understand, the company has just been recently acquired uh, by so, Monster Energy. Yeah, three hundred thirty-five million. Yeah. Wow, they did very well for themselves. Yeah. Awesome. So with that, Daryl and Phil, let show us what you got tonight, guys. For for me, I, I'll go first. Um, look, I I've, I've been in uh, uh, cybersecurity and uh, data governance for a long time, almost 23 years. Um, about uh, three years ago, I ended up uh, meeting a couple of guys um, at a veterans parade. Um, and, and before then, my wife and I were looking at opening up our own brewery. That brewery is going to be called Thirsty Bear Brewing, and it was going to be here in Apopka as well. Um, so my wife got out of a workout thing. So she ended up going to a Veterans Day thing and then and saw the three odd guys there. Um, and she said, you guys, you should come up and talk to these guys. And, you know, of course, anytime I have a, an opportunity to interact with uh, brewery, you know, aficionados, I'm going to go and, and do that. So I went up there and I think we all immediately clicked and Philip can attest to that. Maybe i or, or he can just yep. be real honest and say, nope, no, that's but, good. Um, I think, I think we all clicked. Um, and then, uh, what was it like, Philip? A couple of weeks later, we ended up, well, we're in Apopka, which is a big country place. So we ended up going to a tractor pull and yep. uh, the three odd guys had all the beer there. And I think that night, the brewery actually sold $6,000 worth of beer. And we weren't even a brewery yet, right? We were brewing beer out of our brewer's garage, right? And, and I'll let Philip tell you the backstory on how three odd guys became three odd guys. But as far as how I became part of them is like, after I saw that, that one night I said, look, I'm sold, you know, and, and I invested with these guys, but I, I told them I didn't want to just be an investor. I wanted to be an active member of the ownership group. Um, in other words, whatever they were doing, I wanted to be too. I wanted to get my hands dirty and blood, sweat, tears and brew beer. And that's so what we ended like, up doing. And you're like the chef of the three stooges. You're like the one that showed up at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Listen. Sort of. Um, yeah. No, listen, ahead, we, uh, you know, what's funny is um, the, the, the original story, the OGs, all of the originals uh, came from a garage in Apopka. And we, you know, we brewed beer. And what happened was, is Josh, our head brewer, was brewing great beers out of a garage. And what happened was we started seeing folks show up in our neighborhood that we had never seen before. And I'm like, why are you here? And who are you? And why are you in our garage? So word got out that our beers were uh, really delicious. And uh, so at that point, we knew we were onto something. So uh, there were originally three guys. So the story is simple. There were originally three guys who, who uh, you know, brewed the original beers. But the, 
But the thing is, is there's five guys, including Daryl, who really got this thing off the ground. Uh, and we didn't want to change the name to five guys. Obviously there's a burger joint that's called five guys. So, so we said, screw it. We're going to keep it as three eyed guys. And by the way, anybody that knows us knows that there are still three of us that are odd and the other two aren't. So we'll let you guys decide who that is, but um, we don't have enough to make a, an intelligent decision yet. So, not yet. You, you eventually will. All right, guys. So now let's get to the important stuff. You've got eight different brews that you're offering this evening. Tell us Tonight, about Tell us about yeah, those. Yeah, tonight we do. Tonight we have a, a great lineup. We will eventually have 12 taps full. Uh, and when we do, uh, we'll probably have to get a second row of, of taps because our, our beers are just delicious. But our four core beers on tonight are we have what's called Chief's Horse Feathers, named after my grandfather. He's a chief in the Navy. Yes, and me. horse. Yeah, this is Jason, by the way, everybody on, on the left hand side. Uh, uh, given yep. Daryl beers. So um, Chief's yeah. Horse Feathers is, a, yeah, he's waving. <laughs> so uh, Daryl forgets that this is going to be audio only, but that's okay. Beard so, uh, envy right here. Yeah, beard envy. <laughs> yeah, he's got a great beard. Chief's Horse Feathers is named after my grandfather. He was a chief in the Navy and his favorite beer was Miller High Life. So we said the first beer that is our, our, our lightest beer we're going to name after Chief, my, my grandfather. And uh, one of his famous sayings was Horse Feathers. And the reason he said horse feathers is because he didn't want to cuss in front of his kids, right? He didn't want to say BS, so he'd say, oh, boy, that's horse feathers. A little raspy voice. But, you know, we said, listen, our core beer on the light side should be Chief's Horse Feathers. It's killing it. It's doing very well. It's very balanced. It's 4.5%, uh, 4, 4 to 7, um, uh, depending upon the batch. And uh, it's a delicious answer to anybody who wants a light beer. We have APK IPA. Now, what we did when we went into Apopka's, one of our concerns was if we have a very, very, very hoppy lineup of IPAs, they're not going to drink any of them because Apopka is a traditional beer drinking community. So we said, let's do this. Let's balance out the IPA that we have. So what we did is we pulled the malt forward. Uh, they're still, still hoppy, but there's a little bit of citrus. So it's a very balanced IPA, APK IPA coming in around a little six, seven, seven, depending on the batch. We have Midnight Bike Ride, which is huge. Uh, Midnight Bike Ride is named after a drunken night where I actually rode a bike and uh, took, took some kids' bikes. Uh, the, the real story is I broke the bike, but I don't want to talk about that. Uh, it had a little pink basket on it and, you know, long story, but I drove, drove the bike around the, the neighborhood, a little hammered one night on these beers, but it's a double IPA, delicious nice. beer very balanced. Uh, again, we balance all of our beers. We don't want to be too extreme on our core beers. So it's very balanced, but it's 8.4%, but it drinks like a six percenter. You got to be careful. It's a delicious beer. Uh, Finch Check Brown Ale is one of the other beers we have on. Finch Check Brown Ale is a very light, again, balanced brown ale uh, that has an incredible taste to it. Uh, if you want to compare it to something, you could compare it to like a Duke's Brown Ale, something to that regard. Very very easy drinking, even in the summer, because a lot of brown ales tend to be heavy. It's a very balanced brown ale. Uh, you could drink it year round. Uh, we have now a smash beer on. Smash is a single malt and single hop beer. That one is an incredible beer. We were very excited about how that one turned out. We're going to keep it in the lineup of our beers. But there is an event here locally that we all love to go to. It's a smash event. And everybody brews a single malt and single hot beer. That was one of ours that came out. We're renaming that one and keeping it on the lineup, but it's a juicy, very hoppy style, New England style IPA. Very delicious. Um, we have Tango 23 now. Tango 23 is named after our head brewer, Josh. Uh, he was a police officer at some point and Tango 23 was his handle. That one is a delicious pale ale. Uh, that's on the lighter side, but it still adds enough hop for those hop heads. Um, Daryl, what beer am I forgetting? We've had everything from peanut butter porters um, to what else is on this yeah, week? I was going to say peanut butter yeah, porter. Yeah, Philip, and, um, yeah, Philip our, and Daryl ruined it and told me that you guys are thinking about doing an anniversary brew. It would be like a nine times IPA. So we're talking at a 38. <laughs> yes. Range. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now that that's a top secret thing, though. No, it, it is top secret, <laughs> but the, the but the problem is this: we uh, have a record to beat. 
we have a reputation <laughs> too. So that what's interesting about what we do is nine out of 10 people, when they come see us, they're like, you guys brew beer. And see, this is one of the things that I talked to our team about early on. I said, listen, we can be cute sometimes, but our core beers have to be beer. We want beer. So what's interesting about uh, the, the lineup of beers that are out there nowadays, don't get me wrong, they're delicious, but they're very targeted. We want our core beers and the 12 beers that we have on at all times to, to, to reach across a lot of different palates. So we've got Browns, we've got New England styles. Oh, the other one I'm forgetting to tell you about is called an ESB. It's a bitter and it is so good. The English style bitters. I just drank it. Is, it. <laughs> it is such a, such a good beer. And what I love about it is it alone is very balanced. So all of our beers are easy to drink. Uh, they're, cheers, good to see you. Um, uh, if you don't know, if you can't hear the music in the background, by the way, we are at the brewery right now. Uh, but uh, so people are going to interrupt us. But the English style bitters is one of my favorites as well. So we want to reach across the beer spectrum. We will eventually, of course, we're going to have a sneaky peanut butter and we're going to have a Peter Brenner crunch. And we're going to have all the fun stuff. But really what we want to tell people is, listen, 50 years down the road, they're going to remember that three odd guys brewing brewed beers, good beers that are timeless beers. And that's what our core beers are all about. No, the bitters, is that going to be a nitrate beer? Or would you guys- we, we, may, we may put it eventually on the nitro line. We put, our, we put our fence check on the nitro line. So sometimes that's a, that is an incredible nitro beer. Uh, it might be, I haven't talked to our head brewer about it yet, but by itself, it, it, that ESP. I, I, don't, I don't know if that is something that would uh, cream up as much as like your nitro might, but it's certainly worth a try. Um, I know our finch check uh, has oh my a God. good brown, so good. Uh, brown look to it and a flavor. And, you know, when you add nit uh, nitro to it, it, it makes the air bubbles in the foam like be a quarter of the size. So it looks like it's literally like a a layer of cream sitting on top of it. And, and it's just a, a beautiful beer. <laughs> yeah. It certainly is, yeah. It's yeah. certainly possible. And Jeremy, one of the... Go ahead. Jeremy had a thought, I think. Did it die? Go ahead. Okay. Don't worry. Go on. So, no, I was, yeah. ultimately, ultimately, Three-Eyed Guys Brewing is all about... Now, don't get me wrong, we're brewing. Do we want 36 beers on tap? Of course we do. But I think what we're trying to do now is take all the recipes we have. We make sure that every beer that we put out is a beer lover's beer. Uh, you know, a, a craft can get interesting and craft can get unique, but we still have to make sure that the beers that we have are for beer drinkers. Um, not, uh, we're not, we will eventually, and I can't say never to anything, we will eventually get into a lot of unique beers, but again, we want all of our beers to be for beer drinkers and folks that love beer. Can we manipulate, massage all the recipes we have? Of course. Can we grow our palate? Of course we can. But right now, we're only a year and a half old. We want to make sure that our beers are for the beer drinkers. Yeah, your range is really good for Florida. I mean, when I was out in Florida, I had a hard time getting good, I hate to say it, getting good beer. I know we just brought up uh, Cigar City and stuff. but mm -hmm. And we talked, like, like, you just covered the major ones, like a double IPA, uh, right. I think it's really good into New England style. One of the things that um, obviously is a little different down there than we get in the Mid-Atlantic is the hazies. Now, have you been thinking about getting yep. that realm with dry hop hazy and stuff? We, we have a hazy. Uh, we, yeah. We've done two. Our last year's smash beer was a, it was called Orange You Acuity. And it was based on a hazy base. So it was a very delicious pale ale. Uh, it was a hazy, but it had that... Uh, what did we use, Daryl? It was the cuties. The cuties. Thirty-two the, cutie oranges. The yeah. Little small oranges. Correct. It was so, a small. It was batch tough because we, we had to actually peel them all. Filter that too. Oh my god. Them into a bag and then it just, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, so it was, it was, fun. It was, it was delicious. Lot. But there was there was actually pulp in that beer, and that yeah. was yep. something that's nothing been seen before. You know, so it was inter it was an interesting beer, but it was really good. Yeah. So you're bringing up two different techniques. So so can you cover these? Build one is. I brought the hazy. Can you describe how a hazy is made? And then we just talked about the flavoring yep. pre-post. Like when do you add your flavoring in your beer in this particular style? So I'll start with the basics. The basics are simple. When you brew, uh, you have three processes in the boil. The first process is the bitters. So the earliest hop you drop is your bitter hops, your bittering hops. So that, that whatever hop you use, 
uh, is the early on is the bittering hop that adds that bittering uh, that you like, that bitterness that you like. That it's the you know the IBUs that you're looking at. Midway through the boil, what you're adding is your uh, flavor, right? So if it's a citrusy flavor, it's a citrusy hop, or it's a, a specific type of hop, it's the flavor halfway through the boil. And most boils, I believe, are 60. And any brewer out there is going to say, Philip, you're an idiot. I do not brew. But all I know is what, I, what Josh tells me. So the bottom line is, is halfway through your boil, halfway through your boil, you're getting your flavor hops. Okay, so that's your flavor hop. Late in the boil, your last hop that you drop traditionally is your aroma hop. So that would be, you know, when you pull that beer up and you smell it, that's the hop that you're smelling. So when we get into hazies and we get into the type of style, the New England, et cetera, all of that is based on the recipe and the type of hop and the balance that you got going on. But the bottom line is this, hazy is filtration. So how you filter the beer is what makes it a hazy. How you uh, treat the beer in the late stage is what makes it hazy. And Josh yeah. should be here giving you the example. But when we were doing small batches, the problem is we don't have a great system like we have right now, right? So back there, uh, Daryl, earlier on before the podcast, took you on a tour of our five barrel system. That system can handle the type of things that we're doing. We were trying to filter this thing through this janky little system. Yeah. So what happens is a lot of times you're, you're, you're drinking what was not filtered properly. So, you know, filtration is, is really a part of what makes a beer hazy. And again, Josh could, could describe that better. But frankly, uh, whether you like a hazy or whether you like it a little cleaner and clearer or whether you like it bitter or whether you like it hoppy, all of that happens uh, in that, that boil stage where, where you're boiling. The recipe is where you steep the beer, of course. And, and, and a, great, a great example of what the recipe is, is if you, if you make a pot of tea or if you steep your little tea bag in, in some water, that's what the recipe is, right? Once it comes out of there, it goes into a boil. Once it goes into that boil, that's where you're playing around with the hops. Then what you have to do is you have to immediately crash cool that beer to the temperature where it's going to ferment. And that's where the, the science comes in and all the, all the fun stuff comes in. It gets into, we have what's called unitanks, uh, which allows us to ferment and to condition in the same beer. And the reason you do that, uh, Trod's, Trod's waving at you guys. Trod, by Trod is another one of the He's one of the OGs. Of, yeah, he's an OG. Yep. Yeah, so the, this is Trod. Say hi to the to the guys, beers and bikes. Hey, Trod. Uh, hey, Trod. How's it going? <laughs> the right. the thing about they Trod said, how's is, it going? We're not going to let Trod talk to us. You <laughs> might, <laughs> might not be able to see I like Trod. Other guys with, with highlights. He likes other Sexy guys beers. with beers. I yeah. think that's the Sexy issue. So he's only looking at uh, he's only looking at our uh, our our host. So yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, yeah, there's another beer. Yeah. Yeah, but that and that's was the way we colored beer. Yeah, that's, <laughs> but that's the way we wanted it. We don't want to, We don't want to see Trud. It's okay. So, <laughs> so uh, he's a sexy man. It's okay. But uh, frank, man. frankly, what happens is, is once you get out of that fermenter, you go into your your unit tank or your tank that you're going to ferment and condition in. Uh, that's where the magic happens, and and that's where the yeast and all the other stuff does it work. Does its work. But beyond that, and beyond whether it's a hazy, whether it's a uh, whether it's a, uh, hey, Philip, you know, before a, you get out of the hazy discussion, there's two ways to create a hazy. Pardon me, because I think that was the question. There's two ways to create a hazy. This is the this is it. So it's filtered, or it's unfiltered beer, basically, um, and that will create a haze. But there's also um, uh, yeast uh, that floats in the beer. It doesn't sink. It doesn't like. It, it's called fluctuating. I think is what it's called. But it basically right. does not stick to the bottom of the fermenter. So it just literally just floats in, in the beer, right? And that's that's another way to create the hazy uh, IPAs. That's, that's where the big ones are being created. Um, that yeast is very rare and it's very tough to get. And it's very expensive, by the way. So that's why your hazies thing, yeah, are, are very expensive as well. The thing about it is this. Uh, a brewer will give you the technical aspect of it. Daryl and I will give you the high level aspect of it. Yeah. The bottom line is, is these beers, these beers sell very well. And the thing about a hazy is the texture, the, uh, the, how it feels. It's got a mouthfeel that's a little bit different. And it also has a different flavor. You know, a lot of the hazies end up being a little more citrusy. Um, so you, you get this great lineup of beers when you, 
when you have a head brewer who knows how to take beers and, and I repeat beers uh, and make these beers unique in their own little way. Um, unlike, uh, you know, adding things on top of a beer uh, that can be easily disguised. One of the jokes that we have with Josh is the hardest beer to brew is a Pilsner because a Pilsner, wow. you cannot describe, you cannot disguise anything. It's either right. good or it's not. So yeah, say, we a lot of times they say the IP is the easiest one to get away from. Very, very that, that's exactly right. And don't get me wrong. I love IPAs. I'm not dogging any one beer. But what I'm telling you is what we pride ourselves on is the Pilsner and the nice blonde ale that is nice and clean and unbelievably tasty. The thing you want to go to the beach with. So those are the things we pride ourselves on. Again, I repeat, I don't dog any brewer or any brewery that does unique beers. What I'm telling you is, is our, our, the basis of what we do are just delicious beers that are well brewed. So, so talk about well brewed. Didn't you guys win an award? Didn't you guys, didn't you guys place top three finish on, on, on a competition recently or last year? Uh, last year, oh. I think we, you know, I, I don't remember. Yeah, that, we don't, I, I can clarify that, Philip. Yeah. Um, so the, the contest or the, the Smash Beer Festival was just last weekend. And okay. There were about 30 breweries that showed up last year. We came in third out of 30, and we yeah. didn't even have an open brewery yet. <laughs> so, you know. Well, no, we did have an open brewery, but we oh, were like two right. days old. We were old. open. At, we were yeah, open, we, but we were like two days old. It was very early. Yeah. It, but, and listen, yeah, that was and the what's, story. what's interesting about winning awards is, you know, uh, it's like, you know, it's like anything else. Uh, that's great. But what we pride ourselves on is what the gentleman sitting back here at the the bar cares about. He says, oh my God, I want some of these to go. Or he says, oh my God, are you pouring these anywhere else? And oh my God, can I get a four pack? That is the most important thing to us. And, and, and in all honesty, that's where we've been very successful in our first year and a half is brewing beers that people want to continue to drink. Because if you look at some of the most successful breweries in the world, it's not about that one beer that tasted unique and had a peanut butter crunch in it. It was about that one beer that I buy every single time I go to Publix or whatever grocery store you have in your area. So that is what we pride ourselves on is brewing good beer and making sure that we keep people happy, you know, whether it's in the tap room or whether it's when they go to uh, Total Wine here in Florida and they can see that their midnight bike ride that they love so much is it's sitting there as a four pack. Okay, so now, now, the, now the question I got. Tell me about your biggest mistake where you brewed a major batch and it just didn't turn out and you had to flush it okay so it's funny you bring this up we are so lucky no no we are so lucky that we when we got into this fire barrel system we were crossing our fingers every day that josh would brew and we're like is it going to be this one that's going to be the bad batch or is it going to be the next one and we have yet to have a bad batch that comes out of that fire barrel system i will tell you in the garage in the garage we had a beer one time that tasted like green apple sour when it was spo not supposed to be sour. We've been there. We've been there. We have ruined some recipes in the garage. But luckily, luckily in this building, our five barrel system has been full of beer and all of them have been delicious. Delicious. We're so lucky that Josh knew how to scale his recipes. He spent time figuring it out. We gave him an extra couple months because of electric electrical issues in the building. But let's be honest. Every beer that has come out of those five barrel fermenters to date, I'm sure there will be one we have to flush, but to date, the five barrel fermenter has been full of beers that we want to keep on tap. We've been lucky, but in the garage, oh my God, there was some we couldn't drink. It was just, it was bad. Yeah. So here, here's the thing too. Um, beers that are like completely bad that cannot be drank are one in a thousand, believe it or not. There are beers that you brew that don't taste exactly what you expected it to taste, but it feels more like this other type of beer. So then they brand it as that beer. And, and it's drinkable and it's sellable. As long as you, I mean, if you're gonna brew a brown ale and it tastes like an IPA, then you would brand it as a black IPA or you would buy it as something else, right? As long as the people drinking it expect to taste exactly what they expect to taste, which is, I want to I want to taste the hops or I want to taste the, the, the coffee or the chocolate. Right. If it, you know, depending on the beer, very, very rarely will you ever throw away a beer because 
it was brewed wrong unless you just completely left it alone and it cooked for three hours yeah. right There's yeah always it fermented in beer and turn it into something, something else so, right? so matter of fact if you look at a lot of beer like craft breweries today you'll see that they brew a base of something and then they'll turn it into 10 different beers right by adding dry hops or they'll dry or you, they'll use a different variation of something or they'll condition it longer or you know all these things so so like if you look at our four core beers that are in distribution and by the way we're in 125 different restaurants bars and uh, uh, stores like total Rhine and you know these other stores um you know the core distribution beers are your that's where your money is the tap room all the fun all these things all the people that come in here every day all of our regulars this is an amazing place but you know that distribution that you get is what made Cigar City or what made Sweetwater what they are today is because yeah. they're distributed nationwide. They have this huge market for their beers, and that's why the likes of the Canadian cannabis company, when they bought Sweetwater for 420 million, they you know a uh, you know Monster Energy just bought Cigar City for 335 million, right? Why did we do that? Because these beers everybody knows and they're recognizable when you walk into any store, right? That's what we're building, we're building. But we have these, if you come into the tap room, you're gonna see these specialty beers that are only brewed right. here and you can only get it here, right? right. No, but if you wanna go to ABC, that's freaking fun. So I do have one follow-up question then I'll, I'll let Jeremy ask his question. Um, talk to me about supply chain issues. You know, it seems that a lot of America is being impacted by that. Are you guys yeah. at all? Being, and how are you being impacted? Uh, we are. Uh, and I will tell you, on a day-to-day -day basis, we see it. On a long-term basis, it's not a problem. The day-to-day -day basis, what's happening is, is we are able to sell our beers like candy. Are we able to fulfill those orders yet? No, because there's not enough people to deliver those beers. There's not enough people to uh, help us um, can those beers, etc. So yes, uh, there are issues in a major way when it comes to um, getting our beers to the people we want to get them to. So we can outsell the the um, uh, uh, the people that are able to help us. Uh, fulfill those sales. Does that make sense? So yeah. one of the things one of the things we're experiencing is not necessarily um, a problem long term. It's a problem now. So for example, there's a local guy that wants our beer. He can't get it right now, and we want him to have it. You know, uh, because there's just not enough people to help us do that. So yes, we are on a large scale seeing um, issues with that. Now, it's not a problem because what's going to happen is, is over time. It's all going to work itself out. But right now, yes, I mean, we are, we, we're, we're fighting to get our beers in a lot of different areas because we have great salespeople and we have people that want our beer right now, but they just can't get it delivered because of X, Y, and Z, you know, whether it's a person. Or whether it's a and, and for the most part, we're Orlando and South, right? But we just did. We just went into North Florida. In Jacksonville. Yep. Um, and we went to a beer fest called the Tallahassee Beer Fest in uh, in Tallahassee, where there was an immense interest in South Georgia and South uh, East Alabama and the Panhandle of Florida um, that they want uh, our beers. There's a distributor up there that approached us, but we're like, the logistics of getting beer from one state to right. another is actually kind of it's kind of a pain in the ass. It's you know, a lot of work. It. It's a but lot of work. Luckily, what we our, our distributor, which has been very dynamic in their growth right uh, and when they see a market they go after it so um let's say for instance coco beach is 70 miles or, or, or so from us or melbourne 70 miles from us um they didn't have a delivery scheduled for that but what we did was went out there and and sold our beer to 10 different people so now they get one delivery now in in melbourne and coco so it's a dynamic type growth for the truckers and the delivery system today. Um, will it get better? Obviously it will. It's going to go back to where it was hopefully. And, and everything is going to be fine. Uh, our biggest issue is sometimes getting hops or getting grains, you know, when we need them, right. You know, that, that stuff has to be trucked in somewhere that becomes a problem, you know? So, but, but so far, knock on wood, we, we haven't really had an issue. With that, so. And, and again, and again, we're in early stage uh, company. 
uh, we, we are very aggressive in our approach. I mean, these are things that we shouldn't be talking about until five years from now, but uh, we have a, we really, honestly, we have a group of guys <clears throat> that are not in this to do anything except make a lot of people happy, as many people happy as possible with our beers. And our unique approach, which is a choose to be different approach, um, is to do things that other, people's aren't, that other people are not doing uh, and what people would not expect out of a craft brewery. Um, we're doing unbelievable things. So we're really excited about that. And that comes through in our brand and in the way we approach every market. And how many people do you know that in their first year and a half have two salespeople that are out selling uh, our beers uh, in other markets. It just yeah. doesn't happen. We are, we, are, we are trying to be different. We are trying to make sure that craft beer can reach the farthest parts of whatever area we can reach, right? Uh, and it's still craft beer. So you look at folks like Cigar City and you say, okay, uh, does that beer still taste the way it did day one? Well, ours do. Uh, so those are the things that we're very proud of. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, everybody has hiccups. Everybody has hurdles. Uh, is our hurdle right now trying to get our beers as quickly as possible Philip, to the people that want it? Yes, bit. it is a hurdle yeah. because there are but people think, waiting uh, on our where beers Philip's right now. Going is but that's that a good problem to have. And I hope is in a very the coming market, days, and we open uh, as during this whole uh, we, pandemic, we get out of this right? situation we're in, whether you know, it be so post pandemic, post whatever, that people. Philip. People are ready to get back to work. Uh, you yeah. actually, you both are breaking yeah. up, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> hey, for I the first you're... time, it's not me. Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy, so, so, so you've been quiet. You've been a good boy. So do you want to say anything? Uh, I'm just curious what kind of volume they're pumping out, right? Uh, oh, good question. What, uh, you know, how do you, what do you measure the, 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 the brewing capacity at? Is it number of bottles per run? What, how does that work and, and where are you in that scale? I don't think they can hear us at all. Um, yeah, hold on guys, we're having a little issue with the internet right now. Yeah, I think in there's the too brewery. many people We're on now. the wireless thing. Yeah, there's people uh, that are probably using some of our connection. Um, are you got? can you hear me right now? I yes. think we're fine now, Philip. Go ahead. Okay. So when it comes to volume, there's two things we have to look at. We have to look at our tap room, and then we have to look at distribution. So when we look at the tap room, it's real simple. We can't get enough beer in those four or five barrel fermenters. So we constantly are filling those things up, and the, and the goal is to get as many of those to fill those taps as possible. So what that means on the distribution side is, okay, how do we get ourselves on our because we cannot brew enough beer out of this tap room to distribute to enough people. So what we do is we brew off site. So when we brew off site, how can we make sure our calendar is full to brew off site? Um, hey guys, you know, once or twice a week, we've got to be brewing our beers off site to make sure that we can fulfill the needs of the distribution uh, channels that we're in. So when it comes to volume, it's, it's, it's twofold. You have your tap room, tap room is fed by our four, four barrel fermenters. The uh, distribution side, our head brewer, Josh, and Jason, the guy with the beer that you just saw, are always off-site trying to make sure we're on the calendar and that we're brewing off-site in these 100-barrel systems uh, to make sure that we can feed the distribution channels that are looking for us. Um, that's really uh, the two ways we look at our business. Um, can we, are we doing it perfectly? Heck no. We, we, can we do it better? Heck yeah. And the way we can do it better is control the whole process. But Daryl's the only one that's a millionaire out of all of us. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know a way to, you know, uh, I, I make like $5 an hour. So, uh, so I don't, I don't know how. Daryl does that, that, that really is. Yeah, I mean, a millionaire today is, is like minimum wage McDonald's job. So, you know. <laughs> so I, no, I got a my, question for Daryl. What, what other than just the, the love of the beer it, what, what gets you out of data protection, data security, and gets you into becoming a brewmaster or a brewmeister or whatever it this is? is? This is going to be a very funny story for you guys. Um, so about uh, seven years ago, my wife took me to St. Augustine, um, and she booked me a tour at the, um, the Southeast Anheuser-Busch plant. Um, and I got to see how the production of Bud Light and 
Mick Ultra and all these beers were being brewed. Um, and I absolutely thought it was amazing. And I looked at everybody there and they were all smiling. Why wouldn't you be if you're going to brew beer? You're smiling. You're having a good time. You know, it's the, the money is a secondary thing. Um, you know, and for me, the money's a secondary thing here as well. Um, but all, all I can say is that after that day, um, I started scheduling meetings in places that had lots of craft breweries. So I would be talking in front of 50, 100, 200 people, and I would make sure it was in the middle of a Mecca where there was at least six or eight craft breweries around. But that's what I told the company. I said, look, if I'm going to make if I'm going to make the trip, I want I want my meetings to be around where there's a bunch of craft beer breweries. So I would go and talk about cybersecurity or, or data governance. And then after I was done, I would visit all these breweries. So as a result of that, I visited over 950 um, craft breweries in two and a half years. Um, and I have a bunch of beer tackers on my game room wall in my house to show for that um, whenever they had one, I would buy them. So I have over 130 tackers in my game room at home. These are basically the metal beer signs. They're just sitting all over my wall. Um, people think it's obnoxious, but I think it's an accomplishment because what I learned from that is that the beer business is, look, it's just like any other business. It's very, it can be stressful at times, but you know what? If I had to worry about brewing beer, or if I had to worry about protecting data, I'd brew beer all day because there's two things that I've noticed about protecting data is one thing is that it still isn't the first and foremost problem that businesses or the enterprise has today. The second thing is that everything's a reaction, right? From cybersecurity aspect, everything's a reaction. Um, and what I mean by that is like, I'm just going to wait until somebody breaches my shit and then I'm going to, I'm going to act on it. Right. Instead of doing something up front to protect it. Right. So as far as me getting to craft beer and whatever, this is extreme hobbying, right. For me at this point, and I enjoy it so much. And it's so much better when you have a good group of guys that we all get along with. And you know what, we just want to brew the best beer we can, right. For, for everyone. And we're doing that. I mean, our, our name is now synonymous across the state. I can't, I don't know that I can go to any brewery now in the state of Florida and then even up into the Atlanta, Georgia area and, and say the, uh, the name three I guys brewing and they don't know it. They've never heard of us. So what, what Philip does for marketing, which is what he lied to you about his $5 job, even though he makes $7 an hour. And I know that for a fact, you know, is that he's, he's a VP of a large TV channel uh, in, in the Orlando area. Then, and he is uh, doing their marketing and all their commercials and all their infomercials. That's what he does for a living. So he's done an amazing job of pushing the marketing for Three Odd Guys. You know, and you'd never think that this small little brew house, even though we have a few hundred people in here and everybody's having a good time, you'd never think we were this small time apocalypse of business because of our name, right? You know, so that's how I got started into it. Look, data governance and data security is a passion for mine as well but it's not the stress reliever, right? The beer aspect is the stress reliever, right? But let's be realistic. Data governance is much more interesting when you have beer in your hand. You know what? I talked to Bank of America execs with this beer in my hand, <laughs> you know? And you know what? They will go to their little fridge inside their office and they will grab their own beer and then we'll have a really good discussion about what your problems are, right? There this you go. Is, this is not rocket science. Look, we're all humans and there's a stress relief somewhere at the end of the rainbow. And, and I can tell you guys, hey, let me it? interrupt. Hey, do you guys mind if I interrupt? I can tell you guys, I didn't know Daryl was this smart. So, you know, <laughs> I, I'm enjoying this. I'm just saying. I hide a lot of stuff, man. <laughs> I mean, how much of a flex is it when you go, hey, I want to talk to you about data governance. Come down to my <laughs> brewery. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That is a flex. You know what? When, That's a flex. And, and I'll tell you a story about uh, my, my new company, Ignite, which is the, uh, the foremost of uh, data collaboration and security today. As a matter of fact, we're getting much, many awards for that. But I had my first interview with my VP of um, uh, data architecture in this brewery. And that's where I got yeah. hired. 
You know, because yeah. I got him drunk and I said, you're going to hire me. He says, hell oh, yeah. No, no just, I, I'm kidding. And you know, how many cases a week do you have to provide? You guys him? have met Michael Johnson, so. <laughs> <laughs> Michael now, Johnson. We know, now we know where the distribution problem is. Yeah, there you go. Yes, now yeah, we see where square. the distribution problem is. <laughs> it's Daryl, damn it. <laughs> Fair enough. Chris, you've been quiet for a while. I'm so doing I, did, so I, I only have one part, parting question. So really it's, talk about security. So I think it's a good, good transition or segue is, you know, where do you see the innovation? Because there are so many microbreweries today across the United States. You just talked about the Cigar City. Like that. But obviously there has to be innovation. Where's the innovation? Brewing, especially in the microbrewing scene, going to make one company better than another. Yeah, I, and I, I can take a stab at that. Um, look, what we brew, look, let's be honest, guys. Anybody can brew a beer if they know how to brew beer, right? But if you brew a beer that makes people think about it the next day or come back for more the next day, that leaves an impression, right? And so what Philip has done in three odd guys is to create a culture of beer lovers here in our area right i mean our business has skyrocketed and actually changed the footprint of downtown apopka right downtown apopka used to be nothing but taco bells dollar stores and churches and schools right but now it's like becoming a destination for beer lovers they know what we're brewing, they know our culture, and they know that when they come up to our brew house, they're going to find, they're gonna find somebody who knows beer behind our counter. That's our hop stars. Our hop stars, they're not bartenders, they're not cashiers, they're not waitresses. They're called hop stars for a reason because we send them through a training session to understand the different types of beer and especially know the 12 beers we have on tap. Right. So if you're if you come in from uh, a rodeo here in Apopka, which is very common, um, these guys are going to say, I'm a Mickle to drinker or a Bud Light. Do you have one of those? Uh, no, but let me give you a taste of Chief Horse Feathers. It's a very similar blonde ale, but it has flavor to it. So just think about Budweiser with a flavor. Right. That's what I would say. And when they try it, they're hooked. They will literally walk out of here with four, eight, a whole case of our Chief Horse Feathers. It's absolutely crazy. But that's what we build. That's what we're building. We're building. It's not, I mean, like I said, anybody can brew a, a beer, but it's a beer that you remember is what we're trying to build here. Philip, you want to add something? The only thing I want to add to it is innovation is interesting when it comes to brewing. So if you're going to brew a beer, it's a beer, right? I mean, I don't care how I get that beer. I don't care if it comes out of a, uh, a system that a robot uh, is running or if a, a handcrafted individual is back there. So that's, un, that's the one thing we understand. So the key is this, making people happy. That's all you need to do. The experience is everything. We do three things here. One, we grab attention. We have to grab their attention. The second thing we do is we connect with them emotionally. Uh, uh, so our hop stars are trained. You want to talk about innovation. Our hop stars are trained to understand beer, to understand the palate of beer, to understand how to sell a beer, to understand that a Bud Light drinker can drink Chief's Horse Feathers and actually enjoy it. So there's training. That's the innovation of craft. Craft doesn't mean it has to be some guy with a handlebar mustache. You know, and that, I think that's the difference is we understand that. Craft is just good beer with recipes. Am I breaking up again? No, who, no. Who no, do you see who's on here, uh, Philip? Do you see this? <laughs> Handlebar mustaches are great. I don't care. No, but... <laughs> Angela is here. This is Philip's wife, Angela. Oh, she did is, she sneak in? Oh, I didn't see that. She has put so much work into the brewery. I just wanted oh. her to give, you know, give her yeah, a shout you know out. That this, is, like hot, this is red. Don't bring this the hot red. chicks in. Stop bringing the hot chicks in. Right? <laughs> Lord of mercy. Here I am being serious about the future of craft. All right. No, but really, it's really, funny how truly. you can say this is a hot chick and it's your wife. It, it is. She is Good. smoking You're hot. Lucky I love because it. if you didn't say that, you'd be trouble. No, no, no. She, she is. I, I, I married way above my head. But the, but, but the future yeah. of craft. Yeah, I did. The future of craft is not necessarily can I pour a beer out of a, uh, out of a tap that I put a little card in 
like we're seeing right now. There's a lot of folks that have these, what's called uh, these electronic pours now. And all of a sudden, pour them. Yeah. to me, uh, where craft should be going and where it should be headed is one, still good beer. That's simple. Two, very educated staff. And then don't be afraid to grow. You know, craft beer traditionally, and I'm talking about uh, as a generic rule, not everybody. Craft beer traditionally has been afraid to grow. We're not afraid to grow. And we're not afraid to grow in the way that craft should grow. I'm not going to change my recipe for cheap tourist feathers. I'm not going to change my recipe for uh, APK IPA. But am I afraid for everybody else to have it and call it their own? Heck no. Heck no, I'm not afraid. So the future of craft isn't necessarily tax savvy. What the future of craft is, is very educated folks who aren't afraid to actually put their wares out there and actually grow. It's really that simple. So we're not afraid of that. And let's not compare. Whoop. Oh, man, there he goes. He just he dropped. The wrong button. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> he's self-censored. Yeah. Oh, he'll, he'll be back. I, I, think, I, I think what he's trying to say is that there's, you know, there's a passion here, right? I mean, we're, we have a passion for the, the customers and the people. And, you know, when I go into a total wine, I might take two or three trips down the total wine aisle just to see what people's reaction is and and i might look at the price tag and say oh look at that man that's a good price that's an apopka beer and the and everybody i say that is like holy crap it's made in apopka and they'll buy like almost all of it that's sitting on the shelf you know and and then they're like oh this is 3og i know these guys i come in here all the time and and it looks like uh, it looks like his phone may have died so but that's cool um but no i i, I think what philip was trying to say is that you know, the, the culture that we've built here is exactly what we wanted. That's what we dreamed of. You know, it's it, like I said, anybody can brew a good beer, but if you brew a beer that people remember tomorrow and next week and next month, and then when they see you somewhere in a restaurant, they're like, oh my God, there's 3OG in, in, uh, in their taps. Let's, I, I got to get one. I haven't had one in a week, <laughs> right? You know, and that's what we're seeing, you know, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll see people like walking down the streets of like beer, you know, if we go to a beer show or whatever, and um, we'll walk around like downtown Maitland, which is about 15 minutes from us, people are starting to recognize us, you know, and they know who we are and they're, you know, and, and that to me, look, uh, you, you know, ultimately everybody wants to make money in their business, but that to me is more fulfilling than anything. It's like me walking into, you know, a trade show in Dallas for cybersecurity. And I've got the FBI, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure. I've got the FBI, I've got Microsoft, I've got IBM, I've got Amazon, I've got Sentinel One, Red Hat, all these people are up there saying, you need my hardware plans. And I'm like, no, you don't need your higher prior plan. And I'm going to tell you why, because if you understand what you have, you don't need anything, right? Because these people are breaching shit because there's a reason for that, because the people building those viruses or they're building those intrusion aspects or the ransomware are paid a lot more than what these companies are paying their people, right? So they're stealing people or poaching people and they're building these things. And this is the bigger problem. And I'm sure we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but for a beer perspective, it's completely opposite. If I had 10 breweries around me, all that's gonna do is bring 10,000 people to me, right? We're not even competing each other, right? Because every brewery is gonna have different beers. You might have 40 different IPAs, but they're all going to taste different, right? right. You know, so that, yeah. So that's, that's the beauty of the beer community. And, you know, we keep harping on, you know, our friends in the beer community. It's like, open up a brewery in a pop. There's only us. And there was another one that was supposed to open pre COVID. They didn't open uh, and that equipment's still sitting there. And I want to go over there and buy the stuff, but I can't find it. Right. I mean, he's got five 15 barrel fermenters and a boil kettle. Like, like a, uh, he's got the whole boiler there and brew mat, everything's sitting there but I cannot locate the guy to buy the stuff from, you know? So long story short is it the more breweries, the better, whereas competition for software or hardware or whatever, it's like, stay away from my customer, stay away. I want every customer to know that three odd guys is there. I want every customer to know that the other 10 breweries are there because it's going to bring a community of people to us every day or every week. We're going to have all these people coming in and trying our beers and they're going to compare us to somebody else. And if they come back on social media like Instagram or Facebook and they say, I was at, 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 uh, at Three Odd Guys this weekend, I had their flight, 
it was the coolest staff. That's what I hear repeatedly is like the staff was so cool. We could talk to any of them, even the hottest pop star ever, right? You know, our, our, our staff is not only beautiful, but they also know what they're doing. And that's the beauty of our place, right? And that's what Philip was trying to say is that we're building a culture here. And I think we're about 80% done of doing that. So, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So for, so for people who are watching the podcast, what is, what's the location of your tap room, Daryl? What's your address? Yeah, we are in downtown Apopka. Um, we're uh, uh, 45 East 5th Street on, um, in Apopka, right downtown. We're literally, if I walk out my doors, I can see City Hall catacorner to us. I mean, we're going to you know, which is Disney. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like you know, we need to do this live at the brewery and all the yeah. beers on me. And we have a, a, an amazing um, hotel that they just built. Um, because, you know, the brewery here established a pop as a business and, you know, people don't realize what breweries do to small cities. You know, I mean, it's like, look at my traffic, my traffic because the brewery open is now 14% more than it was before the brewery, right? And 14% in a city is massive when you talk to the, the, the larger restaurant chains or the supermarkets or e even the grocery stores. It's like, and, and then if you look at the growth of the city around us, around Apopka, you know, the, the growth in our city is about 29% year over year. That means our population in Apopka, exactly. <laughs> our population is growing by 29% year over year. And last, or two years ago, before we opened, it was only at 14%. So what do you attribute that to? Well, every time I look at demographics, and I'm a big numbers guy, whenever I look at demographics of a brewery, the first thing I look at is where were you and where were you after, right? And every time I've seen this after, it's like the, the population grew by more than what it did before. The businesses that are coming in, not only smaller businesses, but the larger businesses, the, the bigger restaurant chains and all these bigger hotels. I mean, Hampton Inn just opened up Apopka didn't even have a hotel, you know, and the Hampton Inn just built a seven-story hotel here because why? Because they saw this population group over the last two years. So they're like, we got to get in on this, right? We're jumping in. And, and guess what that, ho that hotel does for us is they bring in busloads of people on the weekends. They literally have a bus stop here at the brewery. So they will bring in 60, 80, 100 people a weekend to come in and enjoy our establishment we have live live entertainment wedding yeah. parties oh yeah hey Keen, they'll do weddings they'll do quinceañeras they'll do brises that's do, right yeah. yeah the whole thing right <laughs> but yeah it's that's really awesome. become uh, you know like i said i mean it's a, not not only it's it's a great business to get into but it's a, a it's a stress reliever for me you know I don't know how, and I and I know, you know, Al and Chris, how passionate they are about the security of data, right? I have had many sleepless nights about the data that I'm protecting, right? And I've come to the realization that if I don't train everybody that I know about protecting it, then I'm failing in life. And I think that is my mission: is to make sure that everybody everybody understands where you can protect your data and you don't need to spend hundreds or tens of millions of dollars to protect it, right? That's my message to the world. And even the FBI has now reached out to me wanting to give seminars around protecting data. And it's not just protecting data. It's about understanding what you're protecting. Why do you need to protect the cat pictures? Why do you need to protect the boat vacation photos? You don't. But how do you know that's what's there? Instead, we've got people that work nine to five jobs in the storage business and the backup business that are like, as long as my backup's there for tomorrow, I'm fine. But you know what? That backup license is, is capturing 60% of data that is considered redundant, obsolete, or trivial. It's crap. You don't even need it, right? But if you don't know what you're backing up, it's easy for them to just target those shares and just back it up, right? But what happens in a breach? Oh, guess what? Um, they breached all of these servers and we have no idea what happened, but now we have to notify all 200,000 customers that we had a breach. When if they just knew what they had, they may have only had to notify 10 customers, right? 
you know, so Darryl, no reputational, hey, hey, financial, all these things. Yeah. Here's what I think, Daryl. We need to have a seminar that we host at the brewery yeah. for CISOs. Oh for CISOs. Boom. And we'll have it catered in whatever your best restaurant in the town, right? A popka pizza. And, and just a, a private. It's yeah, right here at the brewery. And beer. That's <laughs> perfect. So either way. But at the end of the day, we get an, a much comfortable environment where people can open yeah. up and be relaxed instead of being rigid about, Oh, I don't I know. Oh, here goes another vendor. I don't want to listen to them. That's right. Yeah. I, I love it. I, I, I love the idea. If we can get people into a location, it doesn't even have to be here at the bridge. We can hold 180 people here. So it's a lot bigger than it looks. Um, but you know, for something that look, man, I can supply all the beer that we need to. Right. And, you know, beer will make people comfortable about talking about problems that they're not comfortable talking about. Right. You know, and that's why I introduced the, the brewery a lot of times on calls when I talk to customers of Fortune 500 companies. It's like, hey, you know, mind if I go grab a beer out because I know this is going to be a touchy subject for you guys. And they're like, oh, my God, I would love to get a beer right now. Or some guys will literally <laughs> grab their beer out of their little cooler that's in their office. Yep. You know, and yep. it really lightens the mood. Right. So. That's one of the reasons I, that that I bring beer into my conversations a lot of times is because it really makes people ease up and it's like, oh, now I'm going to be comfortable talking, you know, yeah. because this is not an easy topic to talk about. And you guys know that. It, it's right. And, and you get rid of the pretense. But so listen, Daryl, we're, we're approaching the hour mark here. And I just wanted to, to see if Chris or Jeremy had any additional questions for you. I'm going to get some chips. And, and, um, uh. <laughs> And get some I, chips and beer. I that. <laughs> Here it is. This is we're so crushed right now. <laughs> it's, it's, I will tell you, we're being killed at work right now. It is nonstop. It is nonstop. Yeah, yeah I, normally we've had quiet December's. No, it has been crushed. So, so like I, I literally ate in the car coming over here. I pick up some food for my wife. We're on this right now. <laughs> It is, but it's crazy. I, I will tell you, it is crazy. So, so it's time we're going to switch over, right? We're going to switch over. I'm going to switch beers. So I will tell you this right now. I don't mind sours, but they're much better when it's hot outside. So I'm going to be switching. Yeah. Get, we're going to be switching over to ride the tide. No, oh, I like that. That's a that turtle's badass here yeah. in Florida. So that that badass, this is uh, Lost Rhino. So Lost Rhino belongs to. Um, the early Ashburn days after Old Dominion sold out to Budweiser. So all the brewmasters spread out. One of them, I believe, nice. wound up at Lost Rhino. we got to get these guys on. They have face plants, the most popular one, but I got Ride the Tide here uh, in New England. And New England style is really taking off. I don't know why, Daryl. I don't understand what New England style is. It tastes damn good, but I don't know what it means. So we're going to have to get Look, your brew. I mean, honestly, there's much, not much difference between a New England and a Hazy. For me, anyway, right? if I taste two of them side by side, maybe, maybe. I couldn't tell the difference between two. Oh, I think it's just the way that the, the, they're they're cold brewed versus West Coast is non filtered and yeast is different, right? I think. You have the, to get the, 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 what, you know, Jeremy? West Coast. Oh, no, don't do the don't do the gang sign. I'll do the East <laughs> East Coast, yo. <laughs> We're gonna have a, a East versus West uh, beer war instead there you of go. a gang war. There you go. <laughs> So, 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 it's so already we, happened. I see. We, we can go all night long. I hate to tell you this, guys. We can go all night long with, with beer discussions. Eventually, I thought maybe we have to do, do it another night is have the beta discussion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I got, I got a couple parting questions for you, Daryl. You guys sell merch? We sell merch like hats, um, shirts, t shirts. We actually are in the process now of creating a, um, a web based store. So we're going to have uh, QR codes on our tables where if you scan it, it's going to bring you to a site that you can literally order a growler or a glass or a shirt or, you know, a calendar, all these things. There's like uh, over a hundred different things that you can buy and we'll have things that you can customize yourself. We'll have a few variations of the logo, we have some pictures, we'll have some other things, but um, we're, that, that should be up and running here in the next two months. Um, uh, we want to make very clear that, you know, what beer lovers like is memorabilia from a place that they went to that they really enjoyed, right? You know, everybody has hats, everybody has shirts, everybody has glasses, but we're going to make where you can customize your coasters, you can customize your calendar, you can customize everything, you know, and this is the e-merchandise thing that Philip 
has built and and done a lot of work around um, that's where philip becomes this incredibly immersive person within the brewery because not only does he own a big portion of the brewery but he's a very smart guy in regards to merchandising and and advertising and what market you need to be in and you know if you look at things in our market in the tech market i mean look how things are oversold in our market i mean al chris you know that even some of your competitors i know some of my competitors even in the past have like it's a checkbox thing it's like oh i call myself i i can do this full range of this but when you look at it it's like what's the full range definition it's five percent of this right and they it's a checkbox thing you know so we don't want to be that check mark checkbox guy you know if you walk into cigar city or if you walk into copper tail or if you walk into three daughters or or some of these other you know crooked can is 10 minutes from me i don't know if you guys have ever heard of that but that's probably the most famous florida brewery right now outside of funky buddha um but yeah i mean these guys don't do merchandising and marketing very well what they did was get in on a boat very early and created a name for themselves with a lot of money that they had yeah that's that's good you know, so so one of the final questions I have for you, Daryl, and maybe Philip needs to answer this, I don't know, but tell me about the demographic of your customer. I, I'm very curious about that. Is it so, the younger, middle-aged, older folks? So honestly, that demographic goes from about 21 to about 85. And the reason is because of these four beers behind me, right? You know, older people, 50 to 70, 80 even, they like cut traditional beers, right? They like their ales or their blonde ales, their Budweiser's, their Mick Ultras, their Coors Lights, right? So we had to build this beer, right? I mean, we're, we are in Apopka, Florida. And I don't know if you know anything about Apopka, Florida, but Apopka, Florida is, a, is, is about as country as country gets if you talk about Florida and country. It's not like Oklahoma country, but it's, or, we, or or maybe Texas country. Or Texas country. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, I mean, I, honestly, I, I think the last that I saw was that Florida had more cows per capita than Texas and Oklahoma combined. I don't get that. I don't see that. But somebody told me that's that. But long story short is we had to build a beer that those demographics are going to like. First and foremost, because they're going to hate the IPAs. They don't like hot beers. And not to mention, they don't like paying $6 a beer. They want to pay $3.50 for a six pack of beer, right? Which is what Budweiser can do. Or, or they can have specials of $3.50 six pack. And you get what you get. It's a big head, headache. And you have to drink about nine of those to get one of these, right? You know, so when we start educating people about alcohol content and the taste, it's like, think about a Bud Light. If, if you drink Chief Horse Feathers, think about drinking a Bud Light and drinking five of them at the same time with a buttery flavor, right? It's like, that sounds pretty interesting because I only have to spend $6 instead of nine to get the same alcohol content, right? You know, and, and that's basically what it is because that, that alcohol content on that beer is about five and a half. And I think Bud Light is around the three point. So you can drink two of those basically for one of our chiefs. And if you go into our midnight bike ride, which is an 8.5, um, you know, you can drink four of the Bud Lights for one of these, right? You know, but that hop taste is like synonymous with the IPAs, but our IPAs are not hop, hoppy tasting. And if, when you guys taste them, because I'm going to send you guys some beers, but when you guys taste them, you're going to be like, holy shit, this does not taste like an IPA. This right. is very smooth. It's not hop forward. It's like the, not the first thing that, you know, that grapefruit taste, it just knocks me out with a soury, bittery taste no that's not our beers that's not what we created what we created and we have one that's called seeing double which is going to be actually called um drizzy triple ipa because drizzy is my given nickname here for some reason in this brewery they gave me this name of drizzy um, you're the rap star <laughs> i am a dj actually <laughs> so that's another one of my things that i do uh, but but uh, the the drizzy ipa or drizzy triple ipa is a 13.4 and that's going to be a beer that you can just buy on tap now the one that you guys are talking about initially is we want to be 
we want to build the beer that had the highest alcohol content that's ever been brewed in Florida, which right now stands about 33%, right? We're going, our recipe and our estimates on the one that we're going to build is a 37%. Wow. Right. But it's going to take a year to head. Now I got to yeah, do dog a dogfish head 90 and 120s. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to do a fact check. So someone must have been tasting that 37% because Texas still remains the largest state with the most cattle, right? Then followed by Nebraska, Kansas, California, and Oklahoma, and Missouri. Now, is this a Texas, Florida thing, Al? No, but <laughs> Florida, Florida has the largest single brood cow herd in the U.S., right? Okay, fair enough. So fair there, enough. there's some difference in the words there, but, you know, just... I had to do That's a little a, fact, fact check. And, and so, welcome to Beers and Bites. You get cow facts, you get beer facts, you get cybersecurity <laughs> facts. Cow facts, you get like <laughs> TV channel marketing, you get all these things. Yeah, so, so Daryl, you have you have the brewery. I've got my full time ranch with cattle and, and deer and other things that we raise here. So, well, all right. So, I just need to bring a couple of cases of Three Odd Guys beer to the ranch, and we, uh, we can just we can do our own bull riding thing. There you Based go. On Al, I'll, I'll, Let's go. Look, it's going to take me about, I, I can say this is an 8.4, but if I drink about six of these, I turn into super I mean, I can fly, <laughs> I can float on clouds, everything. Nothing is, I am invincible when I drink about five of these. There you All go. Right. Yeah. Sign them up. We're going to do that. <laughs> All right. Listen, uh, the, I really sincerely appreciate the time this evening, Daryl, and, and same for Philip as well and, and all the guests. that He's right here. Philip, you're saying it, they, could, they sincerely here. appreciate your time. Yeah, you know, we're so, busy people. You know, we have a lot of fun to be had over here. I, I, I know. I spent the last hour and hour and a half, like talking to you, awesome guys. But uh, look, I love it, man. I look. There is a, a market for everything, right? And if you're good at something, then exploit it. And that's what we are. We're good at exploiting everything. And me, I, think, uh, I don't care who you are. Right. You can be IBM, you can be Microsoft, you can be Sentinel One or Symantec or Broadcom, whatever the name tomorrow is going to be. I don't care. But you know what? What it is, if you're not protecting the customer's data the way you should be, then you're failing in life. The way I see it. Because I don't want my personal information to be ever released again because right. it was at one point. Somebody oh, bought a house in my name. Somebody bought three cars in my name. Somebody Cheers opened up $10,000 worth of. Uh, one credit card in my name. Amen. And amen. And I became it became a passion for me to make sure that that never happened to anybody that I know or anybody else again. Now we're so. gonna have that uh, security conversation. I guess that's gonna be the next episode. We have to do this. Again. Yeah. Get yeah. Daryl away from the brewery, and then maybe we do it again. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're just gonna do the bites part. Yeah, we'll do the bites. Yeah, there part you go. Time, right? <laughs> All right. Well, listen, uh, Daryl and Philip. Again, thank you so much. We sincerely appreciate it. Hang on, as uh, Chris stops the recording, we'll have a few words after.